Hotep, everybody. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. And we are finally on. I'm on with our brother, uh, my friend, Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. It is Wednesday, August 21st, 2019, the anniversary of the beginning of the Nat Turner Rebellion in in Southampton County, Virginia. And uh, we are live. So how's everybody doing today? Hotep, Dr. David M. Hotep, how you doing today, brother? Oh, what's going on? All right, man. Now, now, now we finally got you on. Uh, <laughs> ran into some, uh, <laughs> uh, we're trying to get you on last night. And because uh, we what we're doing is we're, co we're commemorating um, August 20th, 1619 in um, uh, Jamestown, Virginia, Port Com uh, Port Com Point Comfort in Virginia with those 29 Africans coming to Virginia. So uh, I did a series of interviews yesterday. Uh, we had Dr. Leonard Jeffries, uh, Professor James Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. And uh, we had you scheduled yesterday, but there was some difficulty, so we have you on today. And what we're doing is we're dealing with, the theme is dealing with uh, the legacy of slavery in America, 400 years, 1619 to 2019, the African presence before slavery, the African presence before slavery. So. Uh, yesterday, and uh, for, for those that just tuned in, we posted the videos. Well, we have them on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. You can go watch them there. Also, uh, they're on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, okay? But we know that August 20th, uh, 2019 marks the 400th year anniversary of the 29 Africans who came into Point Comfort in what would later be called uh, the Colony of Virginia. Uh, and this year is known as the year of return. And we see many African-Americans are reconnecting to Africa, traveling to Ghana, traveling to West uh, African countries. We saw um, uh, 93 African-Americans uh, in uh, December, January were in Ghana with Boris Kojo. We just saw Samuel L. Jackson was in uh, Gabon, uh, retracing his ancestry as well. But Dr. David M. Hotep, you're gonna love this because this is what I've been explaining to people. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, South America, okay? And um, that we've been in this land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years, at least 51,700 years, okay? And this is what's so important, all right? And this is where uh, you come in, and your area, can you hear me? This is where you come in and your area of expertise because your book, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence breaks all of this down. All right. So first off, what, what was your, uh, you know, I see articles from uh, the New York times, the 1619 project. Uh, I see MSNBC commemorating 400 years, but they don't talk about the African presence that was here prior to 1619. So first off, what, 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 what is your response? What are your thoughts on uh, this coverage of 400 years? Okay, well, this is um, absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> this, is what, this is what they want to teach. This is what they've got. They, this is what I learned as a child in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade that the first Africans were brought to the Americas as slaves in chains to be sold with slaves in 1619. And I say, what? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's go back a little bit. All right? Um, and 51, uh, 51,000 years ago, um, uh, there were Africans in South Carolina and they found some um, uh, artifacts and some bones and different things to, to show that. And we'll, we'll go um, a little further. Um, then in, uh, I think it was in Texas, uh, there were some Africans 100,000 years ago. Uh, in California, there were Africans found 130,000 years ago. And uh, this last thing, yeah, which is the, the, the real ball breaker, and that is that um, uh, the, 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 the folks in Mexico, Tijuanaco, Mexico, mm -hmm. right, they found, uh, they were digging down for some other things, and they found a carcass, um, uh, a hide of some kind of uh, probably a steer or something they had eaten, and everything else had, had deteriorated away. But the skin, the hide, and the hair were still there. And they, 
Yeah. It's a beautiful thing about it. The um, the thermal, no, I'm sorry, um, a carbon carbon um, 14 testing on the high and showed that the high was 135,000 years old. And then they did some thermal luminescence uh, testing on the uh, arrowhead, the spearhead that was around this long. Right, it's seven or eight inches. Okay. Someone had made to kill this animal, and they gave it that to around 325,000, 350,000 years ago. So that range between 250,000 and 350,000. That's how long we've been here. Now, where was this found? That was in Hiawanaco, Mexico. Okay. And peer reviewed. Now, I did tell you about the other one. I don't know if you want me to mention that. It's not peer reviewed. Do you want me to do that or, or not? Because well, not well, well pro probably not because you haven't released that yet. And it, because that, yeah. that, 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 that information is not peer reviewed. Is that going to be in your upcoming book? Um, no. Okay. All right. So we'll hold, I, I want to hold off on that uh, right, uh, right now till we get some more research on that. So explain so the, the, information, I just, the information I just gave you will be in it's the new, it's all the new stuff that I put in the new coming book. Right, right. So uh, let people know what your new book is, the name of it, and explain to people what is a peer-reviewed article. Okay, uh, a peer-reviewed article is when a, a bunch of uh, uh, professors and, uh, and teachers, uh, professionals in certain um, uh, studies, they get together, 15 of them get together and they read something and do their own research, and uh, if they all come to same point of agreeing that this research is fortified and it's real <clears throat> and it can be proven uh, through uh, different modes of, 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 um, of science, then it's, they, they say, okay, it's peer reviewed. And, and so uh, we, the peers, our peers, our, our professional peers are all in agreement that this thing is good and it's something we can talk about and show the world. That's peer review. Okay. So when we look at your book, uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. Your book is backed up by initially seven peer peer reviewed articles. And how many yeah. does it have now? Is it still seven or is it eight now? Uh, there's eight now. Yeah. Is, is there eight now? Okay. All right. So this book is out of print. Uh, is it still available on Kindle at Amazon? Do you know? No, that book is totally out of print because I had to leave the, the uh, um, the last publisher who I won't mention because uh, they started doing some you know, things that were not ethical. Okay. Now I'm looking for a publisher now. The new book will be out in probably December or January. Okay. And it'll have, it'll have, it'll be twice as thick. It's 220 or 240 pages. Um, I have uh, 49 or 50 photos and um, I will have almost a thousand footnotes. Okay. Almost a thousand footnotes. Okay. So. Your first book has 713 footnotes. It thoroughly right. documents an African presence in North, Central, and South America. Uh, at the time your book came out, 2011, it documents an African presence in South America going back at least 56,000 years ago. Um, right. and, and in North America, the land we call the United States of America, it documents an African presence going back at least 51,700 years ago, okay? so. When I, you know, and I cite your work all the time in my presentations, as I told you uh, yesterday, um, I, you know, I was doing this past weekend here in Detroit, we had the African World Festival, the 37th annual African World Festival at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. All right. And in my presentations that I do, you know, I always honor and respect you. You're one of my friends, but you're one of my teachers as well. So I explain, I show people your book. OK, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. And uh, I asked people, you know, have they are they familiar with Dr. David M. Hotel? Uh, do, do they know that African people were in this land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago? And most people don't know this. OK, and even I, I even I come in contact and I don't know if you can see the screen right now, but check out what I have on the screen. This is what I show people in my presentations. OK. You see that? Can you see it on the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so this is what I show people uh, uh, in, in my presentations, and it says the truth had to be erased so that the lie 
could be uh, so that the lie could be told. And that's right. And even when I even when I come in contact with some people who may have taken Africana studies classes or they may have PhDs in Africana studies, quiet as it's kept, they're not they, they don't have this type of information right here. So when we look at uh, the discovery made by Dr. Albert Goodyear in 2004 in Allendale County, South Carolina. OK, and this is something I show also in my presentations. Right. So explain, explain what Dr. Albert Goodyear found in 2004. Yeah, Albert Goodyear uh, uh, found some, some copper um, uh, 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 gel heads, and um, he, he also found some arms, uh, and high mm -hmm. And uh, they, they did the only thing to 51,000 or 51,500 years old. That was in South Carolina. Right. So that, that predates uh the the Vikings, the Columbus and all the rest of those white folks. Mm hmm Exactly. All right. However, we we date we predate the Indians. Right. We not only came before Columbus, we came before the Indians. Now explain that now, explain that. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll get nothing now. This is this is in our new book. Okay, I love this. All right. At one time on this planet, there were no other people except for Africans. Right. Black folks. Those Africans went out and exploded all over the planet. And this is before we started growing tall. I'm talking about the the um uh, the Twa, the Anu, the, the Khoisan. Yeah, the Khoisan, mm -hmm. all of these folks who were three and a half to four and a half feet tall. Mm -hmm. But however, they exploded all over the planet to every single continent. And in every single continent, they left their trademark. Which was pyramids. Okay? Right. Now, um, <laughs> there are pyramids in every single, uh, um, uh, like Asia, there are pyramids in Asia, on every continent, continent. Mm -hmm. Asia, Europe, uh, South America, North America, uh, uh, all over the planet. But also, guess what? There are also pyramids in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see one? Yes. He's going to show us on the uh, on his computer. Okay, now that is that's a pyramid that was actually built, designed in Antarctica. That's right, and you see the snow. Yes. Why don't they go in Africa with no snow? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna take it off. There's a couple more I can show you. Okay. That's just one. That's just one I can, and people can go there, uh, and they can they can see them live, even snowing. This will be hard to see. I don't know if you can see this. Okay. Little tiny pyramids in the snow. Little tiny pyramids on the left. Can you see the tiny ones? Tiny pyramids. Yeah. Tiny pyramids on the left. I think so. It's an M tiny print. Pyramid. Yeah. Yeah. Tiny pyramids. Yeah. Tiny pyramids on the left. I think so. It's an M print. Yeah. Right here. Okay. Okay. Then the last one. Another one gets the best. I like to save it for last. Okay. This one will show you men walking around the side of a pyramid. Men walking around the side of a pyramid. Uh huh. Oh, you okay. I see the two side, two men. Two the men. Side, it is a big it's a big boulder on the side of a mountain. Okay? Right. And, and if, you, if you look even closer, you can see the people down to the left walking towards two large pyramids that are in the snow as we speak. So, brother, we have been on this planet a long, long time. We've been building pyramids, possibly in Antarctica, even before we built them in the Nile Valley. Say that again. I was saying that there's a possibility that the pyramids are in Antarctica, unless they're lying to us, which they always do, mm -hmm. but the pyramids in, the, uh, in, um, in uh, the Nile Valley, they could be even older than these pyramids, and these pyramids are in Antarctica. And now, now you never, you believe me, there were no, there were no uh, Africans building pyramids with snow. All right, so why, why did this happen? This was this was Antarctica 
brought out off of the uh, the um, the first gigantic uh, world mass. Yeah, hey, just just the camera because your your face is cut off. Just the camera. Okay, there okay. we go. Yeah. Yeah. The Gaia, the Gaia system, all the all the continents were together. Only they, they pulled apart. Some of them pulled apart like this. And um, I, I, this giant um, uh, uh, mass of, of of Antarctica was connected to uh, to East Africa and India, and it broke off. And as as it broke off, it, it, the world was spinning. But I don't know if you realize this, that the the equator is a lot fatter. In the South Pole, anything on the South Pole. Mm -hmm. So it's going to, the equator is going to turn slower like this. Mm -hmm. But as you go down closer to the North Pole, to the South Pole, what happens? The world starts to shrink. So in order to keep up with the rest of the world, it has to go faster and faster. So it was like a centrifugal force that pulled slowly the whole uh, piece of, 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 of that one large system. Um, which, which we now call Antarctica off from from the, the, the rest of the the the, um, uh, the the continents, just like the thing where we were where uh, Africa and the Americas was was much uh, um, one in one in that one big circle, and they slowly pulled away, and they um, as they pulled away, they developed the Pacific and the uh, Atlantic Oceans. Mm -hmm. See, so this. These, these, these pyramids here, as Billy Dato has shown, I mentioned who I didn't mention who she was. She's a brilliant, um, um, uh, um, a brilliant sister. Mm -hmm. right? She's an she's attorney, like, also. She's an attorney. She is she's an attorney, and she's gorgeous. She, 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 she has, she has multi talents. You know, she's a, right. She's well, an she, she's in the documentary 1804: The Hidden History of Haiti from director Tariq Nishi, uh -huh. the sister in there. So I was, um, she and Professor Jane Small uh, last year uh, were at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. They spoke because uh, we were commemorating the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution. And uh, yeah. we showed um, some of 1804, okay? So yeah, I've talked, I've, talk, I've met her, yep, a absolutely. Okay, go ahead. So these, these photos uh, just show that um, these, these uh, Pyramids of snow um, were, were on the continents of of Antarctica before it, it uh, went down here. That was built it while while they was they were thinking of going down towards the uh, the pole, the South Pole. Mm -hmm. So that means they are very, 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 very old. And I'm not gonna go into the age because it would make people say, "Oh, that's not true." Would not. So before until we have pyramid uh, uh, pyramid evidence, I can't talk about that. Right. Getting back to the other thing, we can show that yes, we do have pyramid evidence of um, 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 pyramid evidence that these people showed up Africans in the Americas before there were any other people on the planet. Now, when um, when they come over from uh, Australia, I'm sorry, when they come over from a um, Russia, or I should say they go up into Asia, into China. Uh, what's known today as China. Uh, they go up um, to the far um, eastern region of, of what is now Russia, cross the Bering Strait to hit Alaska. Mm -hmm. and they do that, and all along they're just hitting uh, the black folks who are, who are going together with other black folks. But these are for our Asian type, the Asian types who came way, way after the, the first um, uh, Africans had appeared. Okay, right. right. So you first have, first you have, um, you have black folks, okay, and then after the ice age, it starts taming people to lighter colors. So you get the jet. You talking about you talking about the worm ice age? W U W U R M, the worm ice age. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. exactly. So they start they start getting lighter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these Asians, these Asians are one who came over into the Americas. In the year 2600 BC, and that is proven by by their uh, their own um, um, Bible called the Wall of Odom, something of that nature. The, the Wall of Odom. The Wall of Odom. Okay. Which, or, which means a red record. Okay. How do you spell that? Uh, w a l u m o l u m. Okay. Okay, you can look that up, and and the, the, the folks here call it the red record. So they say that that's when they came over. And it's not until they come over into, and this is a big 
into the Americas mm -hmm. and share that flood with the Africans. Okay? You have the Africans already there forever. And then you have the um the Orientals or, or Asians, you know, for the Japanese today Japanese and, and Chinese, they come in when they share their blood the first time. There's the red man. Mm -hmm. The influence. Right. You know, the ones that we saw from them that we've seen on television when we were younger, every Saturday morning, like cowboys and Indians. But right. that wasn't true. Cowboys and Africans. <laughs> so you so you we, we see that the Africans who were here, the Khoisan, Khoisan are the ancestors that I knew in the Twa. Uh the Khoisan come from southern Africa, the short stature people, they go all around the world, have the oldest DNA on the planet. The Genome Project documented this as well. Um, they, they intermix with the Asians or Mongols, Asians, their offspring are who we call Native Americans. Now, yeah. when we look at old black and white photographs of Native Americans, and I've got a book here, I've got a book here, Chronology of Native Americans. When we look at old black and white photographs of Native Americans, they were usually a dark-skinned people. Yes. Okay, they were not the l very, very light-skinned, almost white-looking with blonde hair and blue eyes. Uh, right. <laughs> Native Americans that many people see today. Okay, so when we look at so at, at this at this time, we're talking about right around three thousand BC, twenty six hundred BC, that you have this intermixing taking place. Right. Prior to that, we see that there were uh, you know uh, um, one of the things that you put out um, that talked about your book that prepared people for your book was something called controversial items in the first americans were africans documented evidence and i know you had this at your website uh you, you're working on getting the uh revising the website but one of the things you talk about is cyrus thomas uh map uh showed one million indian mounds in north america one million indian mounds in north america today there are only a hundred thousand okay what what are what are the Indian mounds, and are these the same as the pyramid mounds? Okay, what well, explain this to us, please? Okay, first of all, the red man, okay, the so called Indian, never built one mound. Really, okay, African built mounds all over the planet. Mm -hmm. They built man mounds in Africa first, mm -hmm. and after the mounds, they started putting the, the together rock, and then when they started putting the rock together, they started, um. Uh, having blocks, and then after the small blocks, they had the gigantic blocks. Okay. Right. And Hotep built the first pyramid that was gigantic, and it was like this, you know, like a piece of pie going up it's, like it's, that. It's okay? a mastaba. It's, 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 it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's the flat bench pyramid, the mastaba. Yeah. I got a picture yeah. of it right here. These are all from my presentation. This, a lot of these slides are from the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic right. Slave Trade with Indian Teacher in School. So this is right. one of the early forms of pyramids. This is the pyramid that Imhotep, who I'm named after, uh, Imhotep means he who comes in peace, but Imhotep was one of the greatest people who ever lived in human history. This is a picture of the step pyramid for Nesubiti Zosier or Pharaoh Zosier that Imhotep was the architect of. This is an early form of a pyramid called a mastaba, a flat bench pyramid, which is different than the design of the three great pyramids that we see at Giza. Okay, go ahead, brother. That's correct. Everything that you said is totally correct. And they started off as mounds. They started out as mounds. Mounds. Okay. There's different kind of now. There's there's mounds uh, um, to get away from floods. Mm -hmm. Mounds, uh, the spiritual mounds, and then there's some also mounds that they used to live in. They would dig up underneath those uh, uh, planks and, and make them. But once they got into the stone pyramids, they were those were mostly bur uh, burial burial chambers. Okay. For, for their, People. So pyramid mounds. So you so you laid out three different types of mounds. One were spiritual mounds. Uh -huh. Another were mounds that they lived in. Right. And what's the third type of mound? Oh, it was, it was a was a the type of mounds where they were buried their dead. Okay, burial mounds. 
Okay. Okay. Now, when we hear about, so when we look at um, pyramid mounds, these are mounds that are in the shape of pyramids, basically. Is this correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was the purpose of the pyramid mounds? Because there were pyramid mounds here in this land also, part, part of those one million mounds. Is that correct? Okay. What was the purpose of the pyramid mounds? Uh, to, to get away from the flooding. Okay. And then you had spiritual mounds as well. Yeah. Now, with, with spiritual mounds, can you explain to us? Like, did they go in the mounds? Were they for what? For did did they go to the mounds to pray? Like, how, uh, can you explain to us how they use them? Bury their kings. Oh, bury their kings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, they did not fall burial mounds. Yeah. Okay. All right. Excellent. Like the Say again. Even though Wakanda is a fictitious place, Wakanda is still a real word. And we see the word Wakanda in Native American languages, like the Omaha Ponca language and the Sioux Indian language. And Wakanda means possesses secret powers. Uh, but also in Wisconsin, there is a Wakanda water park. There's a water park named Wakanda that's been there for decades okay they didn't just they didn't just build that when the movie came out and at the wakanda water park they talk about um the early indian mound builders because i researched the wakanda water park um and they talk about the early indian mound builders and also in nebraska there is, uh, there, first of all, there are a number of schools in this country named Wakanda, okay? And you'll see three different main spellings of, uh, of uh, Wakanda. But at the Wakanda Water Park, they have, a, um, they have uh, historical markers. And they talk about the early Indian mound builders. So the Wakanda Water Park is in a uh, uh, Memony, Wisconsin. This is an actual. Can you see this, brother? Yeah. Did you say Memony? Memony, M-E-N-O-M-I-N-E, Memony, Wisconsin. This is where the Wakanda Park is. Wakanda Water Park. They have wow. historical markers there. See, I've done research. See, I do lectures on the film Black Panther, but my lectures are different than lectures you're gonna see from other people because the type of research i did so here's one of the here's one of the historical markers at this water park it says prehistoric indian mound group of ancient mortuary mounds probably erected by the dakotas or sioux the prehistoric indian inhabitants inhabitants of this region located on an indian village site we know wakanda is also a Sioux Indian word, okay? Uh -huh. And Wakanda means possesses secret powers. We also uh -huh. know Wakanda is a Bantu word, and Bantu is a group of 500 African languages spoken in South Africa, East Africa, all the way going to Cameroon, okay? Uh -oh. Okay, Uganda, um, Kwanzaa, those are all Bantu words, right? But when, when we tie in the fact that the first Americans were Africans, 
and that the Sioux Indian and that the people who we call the Native Americans are the offspring of the intermixing of Africans and Asians, then see, that takes Wakanda to a whole different thing. And then we deal with the early mound builders and we know there were 1 million mounds in this land Okay, and African people have been here for tens of thousands of years. So see the film Black Panther uh, uh, reconnects us to our history and culture, just as the 14 pieces of uh, 13 pieces of Asar were reconnected and, and, and Asar was resurrected or resurrected. This is the same thing. This is the same thing that's going on here. So you just talked about how Native America, none of the mounds were built by Native Americans. Explain that. Explain that. That's right. Nick, you explain that? Uh, uh, as I said, see, those first mounds that we know uh, that were in the, um, the uh, Mound River Valley, mm -hmm. uh, they have they have their dates for some of them now. One of them is uh, 71,000 years ago. But even that's too, too late. Now, where is this? This is in, uh, in the Nile Valley. Okay, Nile Valley region of Africa. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll have to send you the information. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, so so these, these folks were like like I also said was that we there there are pyramids found in every continent everywhere all over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So and, and a lot of people built pyramids. White folks didn't build pyramids. Asians didn't build build pyramids. Red Indians did not build pyramids. Only the Africans built pyramids. Right. A signature. A signature. Okay. We were here. Yes. Absolutely. Been here for tens of thousands of years. Now, when, when we say this, um, yes, when we say that we were already here, this does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying right. is you need to understand a chronology of history, and you have to understand at least the last 50,000 years of history and understand how the transatlantic slave trade evolved. So we're not saying that the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. What, what happens is, unfortunately, oftentimes is people here, we were already here, and they don't deal with a chronology of history, okay? And then they say, oh, well, because we were already here, that meant the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. No, not at all, okay? So, so we have to understand uh, what we're really saying. Okay, so um let's see here let me bring let me bring up this slide here because um you know I, I i when i teach i talk about the film black panther and i relate this to your work okay dealing with the first americans were africans documented evidence your your work like really helps to verify this because then we take wakanda to a whole nother level what wakanda means and Wakanda is a real word. Wakanda means possesses secret powers, which sounds like a lot like black girl magic. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. okay. So if we look at this here, so just so people know, because you know, I, I, I talk when I do lectures, a lot of people don't know Wakanda is a real word. So let's look at this quickly here. All right, because I did a lot of research on this. So this looks at Wakanda, and we see a few different spellings, but we see that. Wakanda, is, the word Wakanda has tribal affiliations with the Omaha, Ponca, and Osage Native American nations. We right. see some different spellings of Wakanda. Um, and uh, this information comes from native-language.org. There's a lot of information on the word Wakanda. Uh, but Wakanda is the great creator power of the Osage, uh, Omaha, and Ponca Native American tribes. Wakanda is an abstract omnipresent creative force who is never personified in traditional Suan legends and in fact did not even have a gender before the introduction of English with this gender specific noun. Now when we look at the word Kanda, K-A-N-D-A, Kanda is a Key Congo word which means family. Key Congo is a Bantu word. Now let's take this to another level brother, this is going to blow you away, right? Uh, what's the name of the language spoken in the film Black Panther? You know the name of the name of the language? Is no, is Isikosa. Uh -huh. It's Isikosa. Isikosa is a Bantu language. In the Isikosa language, they have the click sounds. Uh -oh. 
What's the language that the Khoisan spoke? What? What's the language that the Khoisan spoke who have the oldest DNA on the planet? They spoke the click language. Yes. So we, we see a relationship here. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. The oldest language was the click language. When you study the Isi Kosa language, and it's also called Kosa, but the actual name is Isi Kosa, they have the click sounds in that language, which then takes you back to the short statured people, the Khoisan, the Twa, and the Ainu. Exactly. And see, what, what, what I want people to understand is that when, when we look at the film Black Panther, right, this right. stuff, the, the film is deep. You have to understand African history, culture, language, and spiritual systems to understand the film. And when I, when I saw the film, you know, at the time, I've been studying African history and culture for, for 26 years. But I knew I wasn't qualified to do presentations on the film. I had to do months of deep research on the right. film, on the history of the Black Panther comic book, on African culture. I had to, I had to study all this stuff as it relates to the film to be able to break this stuff down. But when you look at this, man, this thing is deep. Just like when you study, when you study Wakanda, there are 18 different tribes that make up the people of Wakanda. The Wakanda, the Wakandas are not just one people, it's 18 different tribes. So Ruth Carter, who was the costume designer uh, for Black Panther, and she was also the costume designer for Malcolm X. That's a bad sister right there. Ruth Carter spent six months studying 11 different African cultures and infused them into the film. So when we see the side of the mountain, when they have the ritual combat at the beginning of the film between T'Challa and M'Baku of the Jabari tribe, OK, where that where that ritual combat takes place is called Warrior Falls. That's straight out the comic book. That's called Warrior Falls. On the side of the mountain, you see people dressed different ways. They're representing the different tribes of Wakanda that, 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 that dress differently. This is so we see the Maasai represented. We see the Obahimba of Namibia. We see the Amazulu of South Africa. All this represented. OK, so when we look at. Uh, and everybody tuning in, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. Welcome to a special broadcast of the African History Network show. And I also teach an online course called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And since uh, uh, originally we had this interview scheduled for uh, Tuesday night, August 20th, 2019, but since we're doing it tonight, I invited the, the, our Wednesday online class and our Thursday online class to watch us here on Facebook Live as well. So when you all log in uh, to, the, to the online school, you'll see this broadcast there as well, okay? So in the online class, I talk about you all the time, Dr. David M. Hotep. I talk about you, I reference your book. I reference- Likewise, Absolutely. His brother, his brother, this is what this brother has to say. Because he is a, a researcher prior a lot. Oh, thank he you. He wraps up this information with evidence, not facts and truth. Because <laughs> if you base your arguments on facts and truth, you're going to get you're gonna get messed up. Because the fact is, yesterday was raining. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. But today, it's not raining. Mm -hmm. So facts and truth change but everyone is in training this is what this brother and i always always come from we come from a platform of evidence where you can prove things well proper documentation ends all conversation so, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so those just tuning in, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in, okay? And then uh, we're gonna continue with our discussion now. So what, what we're dealing with 
is the legacy of slavery in America 400 years, 1619 to 2019, the African presence before slavery. So we know we saw a number of different articles being written about Jamestown, Virginia, August 2016, 19. Unfortunately, in most of these articles, it incorrectly stated that this is when African people first came to this land. OK, now there is one article from history.com and I talked about this yesterday with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. So check out the interview I did with him, uh, Professor Booker, former, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman. Uh, history.com had this article that they that they emailed out on August 20th. America's history of slavery began long before Jamestown, uh, long before Jamestown, Virginia. The arrival of the first captives to the Jamestown colony in 1619 is often seen as the beginning of slavery in America, but enslaved Africans arrived in North America as early as the 1500s. And they talk about the Africans that the, that the, uh, the Spanish were taking into Florida and South Carolina in the uh, 1520s. OK, that's about 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia. A lot of people don't know this information. OK, but very quickly, and we'll go back to Dr. David M. Otep here in just a minute. Um, if you want to uh, register for the online course that I teach, we just started up a new section. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is an eight-week, 16-hour online course where we deal with thousands of years of history. And we do with the history chronologically as much as possible. And we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade happening. And to understand that, you have to understand the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. OK, so we just post we meet the class meets uh, on Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All the sessions are we do the sessions live and they're all recorded. So if you miss anything, you can go back and watch it over and over again. As soon as you register, there's about 36 hours of bonus content. OK, so the regular price is one hundred thirty dollars is on sale. Eighty dollars. This information will blow you away. And I do PowerPoint presentations. We have book references, articles, all that information to thoroughly document what we're talking about. OK, so we just post a link here so you all can register for that. Uh, Dr. David M. Hotel, uh, let let people know how they can reach you. Uh, if you have any products they can order, any DVDs, how they can support your work. If you accept donations to finish the book, anything like that, give people your contact information and then we'll, co we'll continue. Well, yes, my contact information is my, at this, at this point, is my email address. And that is my name, David, period, M. Hotel, if you don't know how to spell that, it just goes back to the, the person who built the very first pyramid, the motel. Right. This is, my, this is my cousin right here who you're talking to. Yeah. Right? At gmail.com. Right? <laughs> so it's David Joshua Motel at gmail.com. Right. Okay, excellent. And, uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. My Bible book will be, or, or should be out uh, this December or, or, or January, the, the, uh, the new edition. Mm hmm. Okay. Now, also, uh, we're, we're going to have to, you and I will have to do uh, a, we uh, see, uh, uh, Colin, Colin they used to, and, and I used to be um, buddies to to speak with this other guy who um, we used to uh, 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 represent me and Colin, 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 I had to get away from it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now I'm looking for someone else to interview us. So, you think you would know someone like that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> we can make it happen, man. We can make it happen. We can make it happen. But also, this is this is your cousin as well, not the Shaka Musa Barashango. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so everybody get book one and book two of African people and European holidays and mental genocide. He's an ancestor now, Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango, but he's a cousin to Dr. David M. Hotep as well, okay? The guy, I'll just, there's another show that you're doing, that fellow, but he was a brilliant, brilliant, jovial brother. Mm -hmm. and, and learn at the same time. Absolutely. Uh, so the other, the other show was, uh, I'm going to talk to you about it and advertise it with you today, is that uh, the, um, there's a, uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of the name of, of what you would call this, but it's a, a world, um, um, a worldwide, uh, Spot that people should be going to, like these other worldwide spots, the pyramids, and uh, um, other different things of that nature. And it's now a mile off of Bimini and 30 feet of water. So you would know what I'm talking about. Say that again now. The Bimini, the Bimini Road. Oh, Bimini Road, yeah. Yes. So I'm going to be, uh, as soon as my book comes out, I'm going to be uh, going down there getting. 
together uh, tours for people to be able to get on a boat, a black bottom boat, and go on this thing to road. And what is it? It's a, uh, it's a 600 yard long breakwater. And then right behind that, about 50 yards, there's a pier. The pier was one, was one uh, uh, connected to the land, and the breakwater was out 50 or 60 yards farther. So the water would break on the breakwater, and in, inside that uh, little pool would be no, uh, no way so that the, the, uh, uh, the ships that were unloading would not have to, uh, have to go up and down and have to throw the waves. They were in flat water. So these guys built this thing 600 yards long with the pier and 600 yards long with the breakwater. And uh, these blocks were big blocks, exactly like the pyramid blocks, uh, five to 30 tons each. And they were not uh, connected by, by uh, cement. <laughs> they were cut perfectly down, uh, perfectly uh, flat on the side. So that when they were put together like this, you couldn't even hit a, a you could not put a uh, razor blade in the toilet. So this is identical to the, the uh, building we see in, uh, in ancient Egypt and the Nile Valley. So who else could that be? We're wow. talking about who built these things, and it had to be built before the flood, the flood of the uh, ice age melted. All right. Once the ice age melted, it flooded this area. So we're talking about between 11 and 115,000 years ago. This phenomenal thing was built. So uh, while we're going into this, not later, we, we may, hopefully we can, get a, we can do a uh, show together but, on, on that. Oh, absolutely, man. Just let, let me know. Uh, let me know anytime and uh, we'll make that happen as well. Okay. 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 All right. Now, Erica here on uh, who follows has been following me for years here on uh, uh, the African History Network. She says she has been trying to get a copy of your book, Dr. David M. Hotel. Oh, and she oh, and she is upset. <laughs> Right. <laughs> now, do you have uh, you have uh, any of your information on DVD lectures that people can order and support you that way till your book comes out? Because because you know it, 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 you know people just so people we understand you know it's not like we get like checks every month for this. We don't we we have to create our own income. We don't have pension plans and all that stuff. You know, for most of us. But you know, go ahead, brother. Very, very well versed in how to do that. Uh, I'm just gonna have to bend his ear and ask him to teach me how to do this. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right, call uh, me, man. Then, you know, first I don't know who you are. You are one of the most world-renowned entrepreneurs who <laughs> speaks about nothing that he cannot prove. He is also a, a person who goes with evidence, and if he says it, you better take it to the bank because he's in there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I, I try to make it happen, man. I try to make it happen. Well, you know, I, I learned, you know, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor James Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha, Kamene, Dr. Ray Higgins. Those are some of my teachers, man. And you see, I've been studying 27 years. I started studying in college, Wayne State University in Detroit, 1992. So um, I learned and, and see my degrees in business administration. So in the business school, we learn how to do research. Because when you're trying, when you're trying to get investments for businesses, when you're trying to um, start a new product and and uh, you have to get it financed through, uh, we have the research and development department. But when you try, when you are uh, making the case to create a new product in a company, something like that, it has to be backed up by research, market research, it has, things like this. It has to be backed up by research. So in the business school, we learn how to do research. Okay, so so this is so that's why I come, you know, I come hard with the research. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So let me see. Let's, let's look at some of our comments here. We'll be here for a few more minutes, everybody. Okay, so we have Erica, we have Anita. Then also I posted a link here, everybody, for the um, the lecture. It's all, uh, almost three hour presentation I did dealing with the film Black Panther. Black Panther Analysis, African Culture, History, and Afrofuturism. Okay, so we posted the link here if you want to order that. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I go deep into this information and break this down. Uh, let's see here. Let's look at, uh, let's try to look at some of the uh, comments here. We've got, uh, who else we have? Uh, Shamrock, uh, Janine, 
Okay, just a few of the people watching. Jolyn, how's everybody doing? Okay, all right. Now, uh, so we talked about the pyramid mounds. Um, we we talked about the Khoisan. Um, when we you you lay out a number of different things here, controversial items in the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. Controversial items. Uh, in the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. I, I, I want to look at just a couple of these here. Um, you talk about Captain John Smith, um, 1607, Jamestown, Virginia. And you talk about Captain John Smith reported being captured by black Indians. Okay, explain, hey, ex explain that to us. Okay, well, he was uh, uh, one of the encroachers and he was going where he wasn't supposed to be. And um, these Indians, instead of killing him, uh, they took him as a, as a, uh, as a prisoner. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they had different things going back and forth between them. And uh, evidently, they, uh, they, they did not kill him. And they let him go, and he came back, and he, he told his experience. His experience. And uh, if, if it was a reverse, I guarantee you, the Indians would have been killed. Right, right, right. You talk, you talk about this on page sixty-five and sixty-six of your book, um, right. John Smith and Black Indians. And and I'm just going to quote you right here for a minute, if you don't mind me uh, doing that, so people will know exactly what we're talking about, because they probably haven't heard. I, I doubt if they heard this story yesterday. Uh, I doubt if they heard this story during the four hundredth year anniversary uh, commemoration. But in sixteen oh seven, the English. Englishman Captain John Smith built the first permanent Caucasian settlement in North America in Jamestown, Virginia. While building the settlement, Captain John Smith made made contact with the Powhatan tribe. The is that how you pronounce it, Powhatan? Exactly. Okay. The Powhatans were part of of the Algonquian speakers. We're gonna to come to who the Algonquin were also in just a minute. Were part of the Algonquian speakers who were the largest group of Indians in Virginia as late as the time Captain John Smith arrived. There were more than, there were more than 10,000 Algonquian in Virginia alone before the colonists arrived, before Europeans arrived. Quote, Europeans called the, De the Delaware Indians redskins because of their reddish natural complexion and the vermilion makeup they were fond of and decorated their bodies, end quote. Therefore, they were unfortunately called redskins and sometimes called red devils by the European settlers, also referring to their skin tone. In 1607, Captain John Smith described the chief of the Powhatans writing, quote, Powhatan more like a devil than a man with with some 200 more as black as himself, B-L-A-C-K-E, which is how they spell black in the early 17th century, the English, okay? This is why when you read that fake Willie Lynch letter 1712, if you actually understand language and sentence structure, there are words in that, in that letter that didn't exist in the early 18th century, it's, and, and, and especially among the English, they didn't speak that way, and the sentence structure was different, and the way they spelled words was different. Okay, so so, so you got to reference Professor Manu Ampim, M A N U, M A N U A M P I M. Go to his website manuampim.com and read his three essays, Death to the Witty Lynch Speech, where he breaks down. Because I've interviewed him a number of times, he breaks wow. down his from a wow. historical and linguistic perspective why the Willie Lynch letters are fraud and why Willie Lynch never historically existed. And then also Dr. Fabina Ashanti has come out and admitted he wrote the Willie Lynch letter in 1970. Okay, so we need to deal with real history as opposed to fairy tales and BS, all right? Now, as, as you go on and continue on page 66 of the First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, when Captain John Smith described the chief of the Powhatans indirectly saying his braves were as black as he was, it is logical to assume that he too was black. When Captain John Smith described the Powhatans as devils and black, he was referring to skin tone. Dr. Clyde Winters, okay, who wrote the, he wrote the introduction to your book, I think it was the introduction, 
Dr. Clyde Winters, yeah. another brilliant historian, agrees saying, quote, early Americans were certainly, would certainly be able to tell the difference between paint and complexion, end quote. In any case, whether the Powhatans were black at that late date or not, does not change the fact that the first Americans were Africans. These first right. Americans remained black complexioned until 3000 BC, when the first Asians entered and began to mix blood with the proto-American Africans. So break this, explain this, explain this uh, uh, to us, uh, for people. Because some people are hearing this the first time. They thought we just first came here 400 years ago, conquering and shackled in chains and things like this. And, you know, it, it's like when I speak to, uh, when, I, when I do presentations and I speak, uh, and there's a lot of elders in the audience and I tell them Columbus never came to this land. We call it the United States of America. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Right. So explain, uh, <laughs> explain this to us. Okay, well, first of all, they're the ones that are crazy because they believe in this garbage that they have been taught in school. Mm -hmm. Lies. Okay. So, right. So, uh, who, who's really crazy? The, the one who tells lies or the one who's done research and has this research grounded in evidence? Mm -hmm. That would be you, brother. Okay. Okay, so, Thank so you. that's how we go. So, uh, you want to know exactly what about uh, what we mentioned and these, uh, these Indians? What do you exactly want to know? Well, no, no. Break, break down what you were explaining here on page 65 and 66 of your book, dealing with the, the Powhatans, Black Indians, all that stuff. Right. Well, um, what they try to do is they try to disguise, disguise uh, us. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as being uh, of someone else, they, wherever they can, you mm -hmm. know, push us aside and to say, well, this is a foreign people, these are uh, uh, people from Mars and these people from Venus and all that other stuff, you know, that craziness that they talk about. But what, what they, when they slip up, they slip up and they put a little, little sentences like that you saw, like black people as black as also. And of course, he started talking about their skin color. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's some other parts, some other places uh, in there where it goes even deeper than that. Right. And uh, we, we'll see now that in my in my new edition, they explain a little bit better these things that uh, the first the first Americans, of course, were Africans and they were all over the planet and every like I said, building pyramids in every single uh, uh, area and continent on the planet, including Antarctica. So we were everywhere. Exactly. So everywhere, everywhere. You know? Exactly. Well, we still are. Exactly. So when we um you you talk about the Algonquins, okay? And one thing I explain to people is that when Europeans came to this land, when, when they came here, Jamestown, Virginia, things like this, when they came to this land, they relabeled different African groups, different African nations that were already here, they relabeled them Native Americans. So then, if you don't understand that history prior to when Europeans got here, you don't know that the Algonquins are referring to African people. Okay? That's right. Explain who the Algonquins were. The Algonquins were Africans, period. And uh, slowly but surely, they are, they are intermixed with the, uh, with the people from uh, the, the, obviously the Asians, mm -hmm. right? However, even though they were in a mix, in a mix and I'm going further than what you asked about. Uh, That's right. Uh, so they were, they were mixed there. There are still in existence in America, black Indians were not mixed. Can you believe that? In America, black Indians were in not mixed. America, in, in North America, there are Native American Indians who are not mixed. Oh, yeah. Anything else. Yeah. Pure African. Yeah. Right? Now, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I wrote the book in 2011, mm -hmm. okay? And I went down to, uh, I was invited down to speak down in New Orleans, and I went down there, and my mind was blown because I met, I met some of the most powerful women and the most incredible ladies I had ever met, and that is Chief Wars. Yes. Oh, my God. Let me tell you how bad this I, is. I talked to her before. You put me in contact with her. Yes, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, we uh, talked. We talked for a good hour. Well, she talked to me basically the whole time. It was about. Yeah. An hour. <laughs> well, you know, I'm getting anything worse than that. But let me tell you something. So, you know what I think? 
that's what I think. And what I know is that she never says the same thing twice. Mm -hmm. She's very interesting, and she can prove anything that she talks about. Right. 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 When, when I was down there, she took me around. This is when we first met. And what we went to um, um, it was a a fort on Lake Pontchartrain, okay, in uh, in Bayonne, near New Orleans. And uh, they uh, they had a a park ranger who was um, who had a, a little booth on the room come in. He would stop people to, to you know make sure they weren't skinned or, or crooks or, or anyone like that um, going to, to do damage or whatever. And he looked over and he said, "Okay, come on by." So he went to uh, uh, he met uh, Chief Man that we were in the the car behind him, he said, uh, he said, no, leave him alone. Let him come to the By the way, this is our land. Right? In the man's face. Okay? So she went in and uh, he let uh, uh, his other tenant uh, take care of his home and whatnot. He, he was showing us around. He said, this is our, this, that, you know, this is our, he said, no, no, let me tell you something. That's not yours. He said, what? He said, let me tell you something about what this is about now. When she was doing that, she was she was burying her finger in his chest. Mm. Let me tell you about what really happened is this man six two, all right, big guy, six two, and she grew up five eight sisters, about ten sisters. And his whole face started turning pink and he started turning red. And he actually had tears in his eyes. Now he wasn't gonna cry, but he was totally embarrassed because she read him like a novel, like a ten cent comic book. Mm. Okay, so mm. she had him. She had him agree with everything she said. He said, "Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right." So this is, is not only bold, but she is she is in touch with her Africanness. Um, she's in touch with her her great great. I think she her family goes back uh, two greats. Uh, and there was a also she's a shot a member of the Shaka, not Choctaw. Mm -hmm. Choctaw is the way that white what the white folks. Uh, mispronounced their name. Right. It's not Chocolate, it's Shaka. Now, there are some Shaka mountains I found when I was going to search in northwestern South America. So they were around, it's like people talk about the, uh, the Algonquin. The Algonquin was a long, gigantic dry tribe that stretched all over the, the Midwest and also into uh, the uh, the uh, areas of, uh, of um, uh, eastern. Um, United States. So very, very large um, uh, tribe that uh, we were very old because they had, they had stretched out so far. You see, it starts, tribals start with a, with a single unit in one place and then they'll start to grow and right. grow uh, further, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we all got from it. It's probably the largest uh, chain of tribes I've ever heard of. Now, where did, where did, El where did the Algonquin come from? Were they, were they Khoisan or what? Who who were they, uh, and where did they come from? Where in Africa did they come from? All of them, all of them came from from Africa in the beginning, and then after. And I'm talking about beginning, way back, way way three hundred. See, like like I said, the three hundred thousand uh, year mark is uh, is is still not the oldest one out there. There's some older ones out there showing Africans came that way, but however. Came to this came to this land that we call the United States of America, uh, yes. three hundred thousand years ago or more. Okay. Mexico, really, Mexico. Okay, Mexico. Yeah. And Mexico. Now they came all over the hit with, you know, because uh, there's a uh, there's a um, there's a fellow who who uh, explained something to me. He wanted to prove that the Africans came to America as well. So what he did was um, he had a a boat, a long canoe. Mm -hmm. Which was about, I think he said, um, it was about uh, 15 yards uh, long. And uh, it was not a sailboat. There was not a sail in there. It was not a oar. It was not a rudder. And he wanted to prove that the people would push in off of the, uh, off of the African continent, um, and uh, like Mali, okay? Right. And they could get through a, a, a flow, a stream, that would take them all the way over to the Americans. Such as South America, and then when it turns up into uh, the um, Caribbean, then it goes up into probably about uh, at, at Washington D.C., and then so it curves over and goes back to England, and then down the Africa. So it's, it's a circular um, uh, type motion. 
So she showed uh, she showed that, and there was oh, so many other different things that, that she taught us. But this sister is uh, phenomenal. You will hear more about her. And she said, I asked her, I said, well, these black Indians down there, I don't see them. Because they're all around. Look all around. These are Indians. And I looked after the black folks. Yeah. Until our ceremony. And then we put on our, our legality up. Mm. Okay, in the feathers and whatnot, and it shows you who they are. I said, well, how many are they around here? So, and, and we they feel about 25,000. I said, wait a minute. No, wait, wait, wait. 25,000 black Indians? I said, well, wait a minute. How many of them are on mix? It's about half. So, mm. there's still 12,000 black unmixed Indians who came from Africa, but have have, have, have through the generations, you know, they, they got larger and larger and larger. Right. So, now, um, where is this? Chief Warhorse told you this, right? Yeah, Chief Warhorse. Where, 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 where does she live? Which city? Uh, uh, Slidell. In which Slidell, state? Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, it's Louisiana. That's mm. just above the uh, water. Right. So, um, now, I say, well, are there any other black Indians who are? Yeah, there's still. Black in Alabama mm -hmm. and uh, and um, what she say in uh, Mississippi and Georgia, Southern Georgia, so Southern Alabama, Southern Mississippi, Southern Georgia, and down in the uh, Everglades. I said, I'm going to get kind of funky. I said, You mean a Seminole? She said, She said, Oh, my dear. She said, Those are our people. Uh, did I give up? She said, uh, she, said uh, those are, she said, Those are our people too, the Seminoles? Uh, her, uh, her people. Okay. Her people. Of her tribe. Her tribe. So she lives, yeah, she has a nation. She's part of a nation, Indian nation, but she's the head of the of the Shaka tribe in Louisiana. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and see, this this type of information is totally left out of the conversation that that we saw leading up to August twentieth, six uh, August twentieth, two thousand nineteen. You know, I read some of the articles at the sixteen nineteen project. Um, at New York Times, and even though you know they had some good articles, they did some good, good research. I think it was totally, it was it was totally uh, disconnected from the history prior to 1619, and it didn't deal with the fact that this was our land stolen from us. African people were in this land before Native Americans came into existence. This was our land stolen from us. So when our people get this information, this will have a total paradigm shift. And we see, yeah. and we see this. So this does not mean that we're not African. We are African people. We just came from Africa uh, originally, tens of thousands of years before they before we were told that we originally came from Africa. So you know, we we have to back the timelines up when this when these new discoveries come out, and when I come across some of my email you about some of these new archaeological discoveries, um, the scientists and archaeologists and paleontologists they say we have to keep we have to rethink everything. They said we have to push yeah. the timelines back. They have to back that thing up, like Juvenile said. They have oh. to back that thing up. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> exactly. So before we get out of here, I want I want you to explain to people about the the uh, the Mandi people, the Mandinka, the ancient Egyptians, and the Omex. Okay, what happened here? Did we lose Dr. David M. Hotel? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Uh, you went off the screen. Yeah, my picture. Okay. Boy, my I I can't see it anymore. Right to hear you. Yeah, you 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 went off the screen, so I'm not sure what happened. Yeah. I don't either. I guess the AC is going off my computer. Oh, okay. If if you get a chance, if you go back into the uh, email I sent you, click on the Zoom link. It'll probably. I can't uh, get it back on. Oh, okay. Okay. Well. Um, can you ask? Can you answer the question? Go ahead. I'm sorry. What'd you say? And we can keep going if you want to finish. Yeah, yeah. Let, 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 let's get to this quickly here. The Omex. You talk about on on page eighty. You talk about the Manding, uh, or the Mandinka, the Egyptians, and the Omex connection. Explain to people what what's the connection there. Who were the Omex? Hey, the Omex uh, were the Mande the Mande people who uh, came over from uh, Mali. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and when they got over here, they joined with the um, with the people who were already here. You know, because Olmecs, the mother civilization, 
of the of the Americas. Well, that's not true. So, well, excuse me. See, they might not. They might be the mother civilization of America. However, they were already destroyed. Khoisan, Khoi Khoi, Khoi and uh, Anu people here. And they were short, as well as, as the uh, first Mandy. So um, I call them the grandmother trilogy. Then the third people who, who eventually come in, as I said before, were, were the Chinese. So the Omics, yes, the Omics came in with all the technology about to build pyramids, build temples. They had the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the part of the oldest uh, continuous civilization in the world, which was the Mile Valley civilization. But when these other uh, um, black people come, okay, the, um, when they mix with them, they become the old Meg, the old Meg nation. Okay. Okay. So, I don't know if clear that to you, but that's that's who the old Meg were. Okay. Now, when we talk about the uh, the Mindy, we see them in Mali. We see different spellings of the of the name, uh, Mindy, uh -huh. M E N D E. Uh, we see Mandinka. Um, we see Mandingo is a corruption of uh, Mandinka, from my understanding. Uh, uh, around what period of time are, are these Africans uh, coming to the land we call? It? So, uh, well, they so they they're they're in Mexico because they are. Uh, we're talking about the Olmecs. Um, uh, uh, what period of time are we talking about the the Mendi or the Mandinka coming to uh, Mexico? America, well, they don't come as early as the as the um. The uh, the short, uh, Cor 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 and the Anu and the, and the Twa. Mm -hmm. Okay, they come here later. Now, from the information I read from, from the, the white folks, they say 1,500 years ago. But I guarantee you it was far before then because they always downplay everything we say and do. Right. So, for a long time before that, I don't have an exact time or date with that. Okay. But, um, you may, you may, must be sure it's, it's far before 1500 BC. Right, right. Now, are the uh, Omics the same as the Omalex? Uh, o M A L E C S. The Omalex, I guess, is how you pronounce it. I, I've never heard of them. Okay, yeah, it should be. Uh, it's Om, it's Omix. Uh, somebody asked on Facebook, Erica. It's O L M E C S. O L. M E C S Omics. That's how you spell it. Omics. That's correct. Yeah, I think that I think that's what she was referring to. Okay. All right. So uh, once again, Dr. David M. Hotep's new book. Now, what's the name? What's the uh, the name of your new book? It, it'll be. It'll still be the first America's Africa but will be ex uh, revised and expanded. Okay. And as I as I said before, it'll be twice as uh, it'll be uh, twice as big as my big, the one that you are holding in your hand. Mm -hmm. It'll be uh, four hundred and four hundred and twenty or four hundred and forty or some pages long. Uh, it'll have uh, almost fifty pictures, photos, and almost a hundred. I'm sorry, almost a thousand footnotes. You see, um, you want the footnotes there to document what you are saying is true, and many of them are peer reviewed. Many of the footnotes are peer reviewed. Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, brother, uh, I know you're out of town, so I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, coming on because we, 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 you know, I did a number of interviews yesterday and uh, you were busy scheduled for yesterday, but I, I want to be able to set the record straight. Uh, I talked some Where you get energy from, man? You're, you're a monster. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. Well, I had to take a nap, you know. Yeah, but yeah, yesterday, I, yeah, I was, I was tired at the end, man. Yesterday, <laughs> all those interviews I did, brother, I was tired. Can you but, tell the audience? Can you tell the audience how, who you interviewed today? Because I'm sure some of them will want to know. Oh yeah, well, well, yesterday I interviewed Dr. Leonard Jeffries, uh, former chair, former chair of the Black Studies Department at uh, City College in New York. Then I interviewed, and so uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries is in Hidden Colors Five. Uh, he's also in 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti. And we have Hidden Colors uh, 5 here also. So you all can order Hidden Colors 5, uh, The Art of Black Warfare uh, from director Tariq Nasheed. You can order that from our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. For each copy of Hidden Colors 5 you purchase, you'll get three of my uh, digital downloads uh, free with that. And th these are some of my latest uh, lectures. Uh, so... And then Dr. Leonard Jeffries is one of my teachers. We have Professor James Small, who's also in uh, Hidden Colors 5 in 1804. And he and, uh, he and I are in the um, 
elementary genocide documentary from director Raheem Shabazz out of Atlanta. And then I had a professor uh, interview Professor Kaba Kamene, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, uh, who's in all the Hidden Colors documentaries. He's in 1804 and we're in elementary genocide three together. And uh, with some of when we talked about some of the African presence here before 1607, before Jamestown, Virginia, we talked about the Moors, the African Moors as well. Um, but uh, I wanted to bring you in because you wrote the book. You have a PhD in ancient African history. Okay. And, and uh, so I wanted to bring you in to have this conversation as well, because what I was seeing in mainstream media was not dealing with any of this type of information. Okay. <laughs> Correct. You know, it was not dealing with any of this type of information, so that's extremely important. All right, so, um, okay. well, well, look, brother, I'm going to let you go. I know you're out of town, man, so uh, uh, hold up to you, and, and thanks for coming on tonight, okay? Okay, can, can, can you see the picture now? Let me see, hold on. Uh, no, you're not You're not connected again. You, you, you have to click on the link in Zoom to reconnect. So I could bring you back on if you if you want to show us something. Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, Try it again. Click back, on. Back to meeting. Yeah, back to okay. meeting. Yeah, and I think it says join me, join meeting or something like that. Join. And then it'll uh, prompt me to let me know that uh, you're trying to join. Back to meeting. Okay. We'll let, uh, yeah, right. we'll let him try to get uh, set up with that. And then uh, while, while Dr. David M. Hotep gets set up with that, uh, everybody, we're going to post a link again. If you like this type of information, if you like the type of information we share with the African History Network, you've heard me talk about our online class. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, we have a new section that just started up, so you can register for that. As soon as you register, you can watch class number one. This session meets on Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the classes live at our online school. All the classes are archived. Uh, are are recorded so you can go back and watch them over and over again okay this is an eight week 16 hour online course where we deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place uh this online course is regularly 130 dollars is on sale 80 dollars and it's about um about 36 hours of bonus content for you to watch as well and this is this is pg-13 so teenagers you can use this for teenagers things like this i don't do a lot of cursing it's not crazy it's not vulgar um and because we deal with the transatlantic slave trade we have to deal with some tragedies uh in our history but i mean it's um I would say is PG-13 also, okay? So you can register for that as well. We also have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, uh, I'm looking for you, and it still haven't... Uh, uh, yeah, no, 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 all right, so that was Dr. David M. Hotep. Um, I will be in those in the Brooklyn area. I'll be in Brooklyn uh, August 23rd, Friday, August 23rd, and Saturday, August 24th for the uh, Black Agenda on tour with uh, Michi X and Jice Johnson, Jade Arendelle. Uh, we'll be at Sister's Place, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, on Friday, August 23rd, 456 Nordstrom Avenue. And we, and we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and we'll post it here also. And then Saturday, uh, we'll be at Saturday, August 24th, we'll be at, uh, what will we be Saturday? We'll be at the Makata Museum, Makata Museum, 80 Hanson Place, Brooklyn, New York. Um, and uh, so I'll be speaking on Saturday. I'll be doing a presentation dealing with six principles of political self, six principles of political self defense, how policies impact the economic condition of African Americans. Use promo code Brooklyn to get $15 off adult tickets. 
Uh, youth tickets uh, are for youth 25 and under. Youth tickets are $25. And uh, ages 12 and under are free. Okay. Visit the Black Agenda on Tour.com for more information. The Black Agenda on Tour.com for more information. We also have the information at our website, African History Network.com, African History Network.com. Okay. All right. And uh, we posted the link here also for uh, if you want to order Hidden Colors 5 from our website, African History Network.com. We have that information. You can register for the online courses that I teach. All of my DVD lectures are at our website. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have bundle packs there. All that information is there. You can listen to audio podcasts of our broadcasts on our shows. Click on the link, listen to podcasts. And follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, okay? If you like this type of information that we share, you like the type of content that we share, especially the interviews I've done the past uh, few days, you can donate to The African History Network, paypal.me, forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. So that helps to uh, finance the research, um, helps to finance our Sunday night show, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, WFDF in Detroit, uh, helps uh, pay the bills, helps us stay on the air, helps cover expenses when I have to travel also. And uh, you can text um, 484848 to Black Agenda, 484848 to Black Agenda to get updates uh, for the Black Agenda tour that is coming to a uh, city near you, hopefully, also. Okay. All right, let's see if uh, any more questions before we get out of here. We've got Terry. Uh, how'd you all like this type of information? Because you did not see this type of information in the mainstream media. Uh, you didn't see it on BET. Um, you didn't see, uh, I mean, the, the closest thing I saw coming to this was um, um, the article from history.com, the official website of the History Channel. They talked about the Spanish bringing slaves into uh, Florida and South Carolina 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia. That's not even dealing with the African presence here going back tens of thousands of years ago. Okay. All right. So. All right, Terry. Okay. How's everybody doing? And then also, if you want to advertise with the African History Network, email us customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay. We'll let you know how you can advertise uh, with the African History Network and on our uh, broadcast and our podcast also. Okay, let's see who we have here. All right, guys, well, look, I have to, um, I have to get ready to uh, fly out of here uh, early Friday morning. And I have a lot of work to do before I fly out of here to head to Brooklyn, okay? And yesterday was shot, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday was shot because I did three interviews Tuesday. So I ain't get any work done Tuesday. Um, so look, we're going to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right knowledge corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself. What you have, what you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. You see me wearing my Colin Kaepernick shirt. So I stand with Kaepernick. Not Jay-Z. I stand with Kaepernick. I'm just keeping 100. Because uh, I have to do another broadcast dealing with that nonsense. But... Um, when Jay-Z said, we're past kneeling, um, Jay-Z is not in the, po in the position to determine which direction the movement goes into because it was Colin Kaepernick that started this. Not social justice in general. Colin Kaepernick started the NFL protests. It was just last year that Jermaine Dupri could have gotten a similar deal that Jay-Z got and Jay-Z encouraged, discouraged Jermaine Dupree from taking the deal. Why? What's really going on here? 
Okay, so I stand with Kaepernick, and Eric Reed is standing with Kaepernick. All right, so there's something. It's something deeper. It's something deeper here, because um, when Jay Z talks about the the you know go watch Roland Martin's coverage of the press conference that was held with Jay Z and Roger Goodell, because they haven't talked about changes in the league dealing with whether the players have to kneel or not for the new season. Uh, And then the fact that Colin Kaepernick is still banned, still being whiteballed by the NFL, even though he did get a settlement, well, he had the right to get a settlement. But the fact that he's still being whiteballed shows you the mentality of the owners of the NFL. Now, when a player and when someone is going to buy an NFL team, and I'm hearing reports that Jay-Z is in position to buy an NFL team, that has to be approved by a majority percentage of the team owners. I think it's like 75% of the team owners. So who else is Jay-Z going to be 100% owner of the team? Is he going to be majority owner of the team? Who else is going to be on board? Is something else going on here? Because, see, when you watch Roland Martin's coverage and he interviewed uh, Dr. Mark Thompson, because Dr. Mark Thompson went to the actual press conference. OK. And the press conference was, was weird, was weird because they didn't did not allow the press to film it. They could only audio record it. They didn't, from my understanding, I don't think they allowed the press to take pictures either. They put the uh, NFL provided the pictures to the press that was used what they're going to do this deal that rock nation and jay-z have with the nfl they're going to provide hip-hop soundtracks for the nfl for teams games things like this what does that have to do with social justice what does that have to do with police brutality what does that have to do with protesting against white supremacy and racism so we saw for the last super bowl and i ain't watched the super bowl i haven't i haven't watched a game in three years i haven't watched the nfl game or super bowl in three years because colin kaepernick is being banned blackballed from the nfl for standing up okay and protesting so I'm not watching the game till he gets hired by a team. You can hire all these, uh, or you can hire all these uh, uh, white uh, quarterbacks who are scrubs, but you can't hire Colin Kaepernick. He's working out five days a week. He's still in shape. He can't. He, the uh, team won't even call him to uh, play. Okay. So when we when we look at this, we see that with the last Super Bowl, Maroon Five was the main attraction performing. They were the headliners performing for the Super Bowl halftime show. They had a hard time getting a lot of artists to perform because the artists were saying, well, no, we're standing with Colin Kaepernick, like Cardi B, okay, uh, I think Rihanna. There was a number of artists who said, no, we're not performing. We stand with Colin Kaepernick. And people were talking about how bad the halftime show was. OK. And then you had uh, Travis. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, he performed. He got a lot of backlash when performing. So then if you have Jay-Z bringing artists to record. Hip hop soundtracks for the NFL. So then the question has to be asked, well, what about Colin Kaepernick in this protest? Are you saying now that you all can cross the proverbial picket line? And now you're going to perform at the NFL halftime show? And the NFL has been suffering from declining ratings for a number of reasons. Part of it has to do with the protests. Part of it. It's not the only reason. People are watching, uh, getting information differently now. People are watching games differently now. But part of it has to do with the protests. So it's suspected that Roger Goodell and the NFL play and NFL team owners feel, well, wait a second, we get one of the biggest names in, in 
in entertainment, Jay-Z. Along with Jay-Z, now, I'm not sure if along with Jay-Z you get Beyonce also. But I wouldn't be surprised if that comes if that comes down the line because he's married to Beyonce. So when you saw top when you saw top named artists and hip hop artists saying we're not going to perform at the at the Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl is the event that has the largest amount of view, the, the largest single event that has the largest amount of viewers, somewhere between some like 130 million upwards. OK. So if you have if you hook a Jay-Z. It seems like they're trying to solve their public relations problem and solve their viewership problem, sign that solve the decline in viewership problem, because if you have decline in viewership, you have decline in revenue also. Because if you have less viewers, then networks can't charge as much for advertising. It's, it becomes less popular. So if it, it so if you if you suffering from this, it sounds like they're trying to solve their public relations problem and viewership problem in all of this and backlash from the halftime show at the NFL by bringing on a Jay-Z to circumvent Colin Kaepernick and his protests. The question I have to ask is what the hell does all this have to do with social justice and Cap and the reason why Kaepernick was protesting? What does this have to do with all that? Because to me, it seems like this is a move all about money disguised as the next le next level of Kaepernick's protest. But Kaepernick hasn't said this is the next level of his protest. And you're not in a position to determine what the next level of his protest is because you didn't start it. So I'll deal with this. I'll deal with this some more later. You know, I when I first heard about it, I didn't want to just start jumping out, putting out videos about stuff I haven't researched yet. Okay. I ain't want, I don't do that. Y'all know that. Okay. So I wanted to sit back and, and get some more information on this. Because I remember when Jay-Z was a team owner of the Brooklyn Nets. He was he was a minority owner. He owned like less than one percent of the Brooklyn Nets, but they had um they had big posters on the side of the buildings, big uh, 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 images of him on the side of the building there in Brooklyn pro projecting like he was like a major owner of the team and he wasn't. OK, so this deal here doesn't seem like it's that structure of a deal where he is a minority owner of the team. But it seems like he's being used the same way. By and, and then the other thing that we have to deal with is. A lot of these team owners for the NFL team owners are Donald Trump supporters and they donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to Donald Trump's 2016 campaign and they'll probably donate to his 2020 campaign. So then you really have to under, you really have to ask the question, what's really going on here? Is Jay-Z trying to change things from the inside or is he being co-opted? And Colin Kaepernick still still being left on the outside. So if you say that we are this we are beyond kneeling, taking a knee, then how is this the next step in the protest? How how is this the next step in holding? How is this the next step in changing the way policing happens, fighting against white supremacy and racism? Because, see, when you look at this quote from Kaepernick, and see, I, I've been studying, I, I've done lectures on Kaepernick's protests. Okay? I have been studying Kaepernick's protests since the first article was written in August of 2016 by Steve Weiss for NFL.com after the third preseason game where the San Francisco 49ers played against the Green Bay Packers at Levi Stadium. And that was the third game that Kaepernick was sitting on the bench. But it wasn't noticed until the third game. He did that the first preseason game and the second preseason game. He was asked at 
a press conference after the game. Why were you sitting on the bench? That's when people really found out about his protest. The first article written about that was by Steve Weiss for NFL.com. I've been following the protest since then. Okay. So the this shirt that I have, the quote is incomplete of what Kaepernick said. This quote says, I'm not going to stand for a flag that oppresses black people, but the original quote, the full quote was, I'm not going to stand for a flag that oppresses black people and people of color. That's what Kaepernick said. So we'll continue this discussion. I don't have time to get to this right now, but I see, uh, I've seen a number of articles and I, I see people talking about it and, and things like that. And um, my thing is, if you actually understand why Kaepernick originally protested, he wasn't protesting to call attention to it. He was protesting to change the condition. He's, he was protesting, he wasn't protesting to call attention to the oppression of black people and people of color. He was protesting to correct the oppression, to change it so it stops. So if you, if your argument is that we're beyond kneeling and this is the next step of the fight, then show me how this fight addresses why he originally protested. Now, if you just wanna get a check, then just, just go ahead and do that. But you got to be very careful when you talk talk about this being the next step of a movement that you didn't start. See, you can't slick a can of oil. Game recognizes game. All right. So look, we got to get out of here. Right now, let's correct wrong behaviors. Not over till we win. Wakanda forever. Talk to y'all later. Peace. <laughs>